Okay, I think that that's my cue to start. Uh, thanks everyone for joining us today. I'm Dave Risk from St. Francis Xavier University, and uh, I'm I'm here to help kick off this uh, session that both Felix Vogel and I had proposed to the uh, CMOS um, CG organizers, uh, the Congress organizers, and. I think we have a great session uh, through the day. We have uh, chunked up into three and then also some associated posters as well. Uh, so we, we put out a general call uh, that, that basically uh, was looking for methane oriented posters that also meshed with the aims of the meeting, which is science uh, serving society. Or that's a, the theme for this year. And so we, we, have a, we have a full day. We have a, a lot of great sessions from uh, soil to looking at methane from soil to satellite, and then also uh, from oil and gas uh, to landfill, and uh, definitely looking at some of our most important sources in Canada and internationally as well. Uh, so with that, I'll I'll kick it off right away, and um, through the session, I'll be um, moderating questions and trying to keep everyone to time. Um, we in, first off, we have uh, three talks and then two poster lightning talks, which are just short five minute uh, talks if you haven't seen any of those yet to advertise the posters and to to try to get you to to move over into the poster platform to see those uh, during the breaks. And then we finish off with some talks towards the end of the session. Uh, so the first speaker of the session is uh, Sebastian Ars from uh, Environment and Climate Change Canada. And he'll be talking to us today about uh, Landfill uh, solid waste measurements in Ontario, Canada, on behalf of himself and co authors. Um, so, Sebastian, I'll see if you can share your screen. Thanks, Eve. Uh, okay. Can you see my screen now? Yeah, we've got it. I guess, yes. Um, so thank you, Dave. Hi, everyone. Thank you all for coming to the talk today. Um, I'm going to present some preliminary results of a field campaign that we did last fall at two landfills. Uh, they're located in southwestern Ontario. And we deployed there several atmospheric monitoring approaches to investigate their methane emissions. I would like to start by acknowledging all of the people and the different teams that have been involved in this campaign, um, and especially waste management, who granted us access to their landfill. Just, I'm gonna say a few words to remind everyone that landfills are the third highest source of anthropogenic methane emissions in Canada after the oil and gas and the agricultural sectors. And therefore it is important to measure their methane emissions, um, even if this accurate estimate of the emissions are very challenging because they occur over a very large area. On this slide, I'm presenting the two landfills operated by waste management that we studied during the campaign. Uh, the first one on the left um, is the Petrolia landfill. Um, it was closed uh, in 2017. There are about 5,000 kilotons of waste stored in this landfill. There's a biogas collection system installed and the biogas collected uh, is used for electricity generation. And um, uh, there's no emissions reported uh, in the inventory for this site because um, its emissions um, are estimated to be below the limit for the reporting. On the right side here, you have the second landfill we studied, the Twin Creeks landfill, which this one is an active landfill. Um, there was about uh, 12,000 12, kilotons of waste stored in 2021 in this landfill. So you can see that this is a much bigger landfill than the Petrilla landfill. There's also a biogas collection system installed uh, on the closed cells of this landfill, um, and uh, the biogas is used as direct fuel. This site is reporting emissions of about 3,000 tons of methane per year um, in the 2018 greenhouse gas reporting program. So the main objective of the campaign was to deploy multiple, multiple atmospheric monitoring techniques in order to, one, compare their ability to locate hotspots within the site, and to evaluate their ability to quantify uh, the emissions of the sites. We were also very interested in studying the variability of these emissions over time, since most of the techniques used to quantify the emissions um, are really giving an estimate of the emissions at a given time, like a snapshot of the emissions. 
um, and we wanted to see how representative this estimate were over a longer time period. Uh, okay. My computer is not happy. Yeah. I'm not sure why I can't change slide. Okay, here's a brief overview of different approaches that were deployed during this campaign. Um, uh, we had some aircraft-based measurements, some scanning laser systems, some uh, drone-based surveys, and some mobile phone measurements, and some remote sensing measurements. I'm going to start by talking about the remote sensing measurements, uh, since it's a bit of a side project that we did during this campaign. Um, and this approach we was not able to look at hotspots or quantify the emissions of the site yet. Um, but I think it's interesting to talk about those measurements. So we deployed two Fourier transform spectrometer, spectrometers sorry, named EM27. Uh, basically, those instruments uh, are able to quantify the amount of methane in the total column of atmosphere between the sun and the instrument. So we deployed two of those instruments, one upwind and one downwind of the landfills. And we wanted to see if we were able to observe an enhancement of uh, the amount of methane in the total column due to the sites. As you can see on the two figures here uh, on this slide, um, uh, you have the red dots that represents um, the amount of methane in, in the total column upwind of the site, and in black, the, the amount of methane um, in, the downwind in the downwind column of the site. Um, and you can see that at the Petrolia landfill, we were able to observe enhancements between 0 and 10 ppbs. And for Trincrete, we were able to observe enhancements between 2 and 60 ppbs. So this technique is very promising, um, and it shows that both sites are actually emitting methane, and uh, that the Trin Creek site um, is a much larger source of methane than uh, the Petrolia sites. So let's start with the mapping of the landfills, um, and let's start with Petrolia on the left. Um, so we had four different mappings of this site. The first one was done uh, with the surface emission monitoring approach, SEM, uh, which is like the standard approach uh, already required by the US EPA. Basically, the operators are working the landfill with handheld flame ionization detection detectors. Um, these are like so uh, some low precision sensors of about 1 ppm. Um, but this low precision is enough because they're directly measuring um, the concentrations right on the surface. So it's enough to locate hotspots. The drone team also did some mapping of, this, of the site. Um, they find seven sources within the Petrolia landfill, a lot represented by those um, red circles. And we also did some um, mapping with the mobile platforms. Overall, you can see that the different techniques agree pretty well on the location of the hotspots. Uh, we can see that like on the southeast part of the landfill, uh, they all find the hotspot, same on the south part, um, and same like on the west part. For the Twin Creeks landfill, it was a bit more complicated to do this mapping exercise because um, of the activity uh, inside the site. Uh, there are a lot of trucks getting in and out, so you don't really want to stand in their way. Um, but the drone team uh, was able to uh, map part of the site, um, represented by this black uh, dashed box here. Uh, and they found two main sources within this area. The first one is the active cell of the landfill, represented by this big uh, red circle. And the second one on the northeast, um, which is a leachate pond. Um, West Management also did some surface emission monitoring um, of the closed cells of the landfills outside of the area uh, surveyed by the drone team. Uh, and they also find some uh, hotspots on those closed cells. So really one of the key findings of this exper mapping experiment, I think, um, is that most of the hotspots that we find um, on those landfills are actually located on the edges of the landfills and not, not really um, in the center, which is something that I was not really aware of before starting this campaign. OK, so now I'm going to present um, the different technique used to estimate the methane emissions of the landfill. Um, first, we used an open path scanning system called the Orion. This system is based on uh, laser dispersion spectroscopy, LDS, and uh, the Orion was developed by a British company in America. 
It was deployed at the closed landfill Petrolia over a month in October 2021, um, and it performed some continuous path average concentrations measurements. So basically, the, anal the, anal the analyzer has a rotating scanning head, uh, which sends laser beams to retroreflectors um, and measures the concentrations along the path. As you can see on the figure on the right here, um, the system was deployed uh, on the south part of the landfill uh, and was surrounded, by, it was surrounded by 11 retroreflectors. So it was able to quantify the emission over this area of the landfill only. The placement of the retroreflector was limited by the turn slope and the line of sight, uh, and that's why they were not able to um, survey a larger area. You have here on the bottom um, left of the landfill, um, an example of uh, the measurements done by the Orion. And um, the Mirico team was able to estimate the emissions of this uh, part of the site um, at about uh, 12 kilograms per day. Um, this estimate can appear to be a, a bit low, but it is consistent with the mapping survey, which did not find any hotspots in this area. Another interesting finding about this technique is that um, uh, it showed that the emissions were highly variable over the course of a month um, with emission peaks up to 65 kilograms per day, which is uh, five times the average emissions uh, of this area. The second approach we deployed um, to estimate the emissions is an aircraft-based survey with the Global Airborne Observatory GAO from Carbon Mapper and University of Arizona. This platform is equipped with a visible infrared imaging spectrometer uh, to collect data during flight. Um, an important point uh, to keep in mind about this platform is that it is only sensitive to really strong point sources of a site, and it's not going to be able to, um, to see uh, more diffusive emissions. Um, so this platform did two surveys of the two sites, one in May 2021. You can see a map of uh, their flight uh, on the right here. During this survey, they were not able to detect any emissions at the Petrolia landfill, um, and they were not also able to detect any emissions at the Tree Creek landfill because um, the site was obscured by clouds. Uh, they were from the second uh, survey in August 2021, and they were still not able to detect any emissions for the closed landfill. But this time, they were able to estimate the emissions of the active landfills, and they estimated that these emissions were uh, 40, around 4,300 um, kilograms per day. Another approach to quantify the emissions uh, consists of uh, drone-based surveys. Um, these measurements were performed by a Canadian uh, company, Aerometrics. They used a combination of a drone with a sensitive mid-infrared laser spectrometer and a 3D uh, sonic anemometer. Their general approach consisted of mapping the site uh, and to locate the main sources of uh, of, the of the site. And then they perform um, what they call a flux curtain methodology um, to try to estimate uh, separately the emissions of each of those uh, hotspots. You can see on the right here um, the extent of their measurements at the two landfills and an example of, um, of the flux curtain uh, uh, with the two uh, figures on the bottom right. Um, so yeah, basically what they did is they quantified separately all of the emissions of each source, and then to estimate the emission of the, the total emission of the site, they just add, add up all the emissions um, of the different sources. And they were able to estimate that Petrolia was emitting about 163 kilograms per day of methane, and Tree Creek's a little bit more, um, 376 kilograms per day. Finally, the last approach we used uh, to estimate the emissions uh, consists of mobile plume measurements coupled with a Gaussian model and a statistical inversion. Um, the, plat the mobile platforms we used were equipped with a precision analyzers, um, a weather station, and a GPS. Um, you can see an example of the plume that we observed during this campaign at the active landfill Fin Creeks um, on the figures on the top left. I'm not going to go too much into the details uh, about uh, how we estimated the emissions. Um, but basically, with these techniques, we estimate emissions uh, around uh, 475 kilograms per day for Petrolia and uh, 8,500 kilograms per day for Twin Creeks. So on this slide, I wanted to put together the results of most of the techniques we deployed during the campaign. Um, when you look at this plot, it is important to keep in mind that um, 
each of the technique, it's, it's, it's not really comparable uh, because it's not sensitive to the infraction uh, of the emissions of the landfill. So it's really difficult to do like an apple to apple comparison with those different um, estimates, but uh, it's still interesting to, to see how they perform. So you can see that uh, for both sites, um, the estimate with the vehicle survey is much higher than uh, with the other techniques. Um, you can see that for the active landfill, um, our estimate with the vehicle surveys is very close to, um, to um, the estimate reported in the 2018 greenhouse gas reporting program. You can also see that the drone surveys are usually lower than um, uh, the estimate with the vehicle surveys. Um, this is especially for the closed landfill. I think this difference is probably due to the fact that their total estimate corresponds to the sum of the emissions of all the hotspots, and they don't really take into account um, the low diffusive emissions uh, that can be observed by the RN system. Um, and for the active landfill, they were not able to survey the old landfill, so that's, ex that's explaining why they have lower emissions. Finally, for GAO, um, you can see that they also found lower emissions than um, with the vehicle survey estimates. Um, and this is probably because uh, they're only sensitive to really strong so so point sources inside the site. So I think this estimate is probably um, corresponds to the emissions of the active part of the landfill mostly, um, which is why it's lower. So I think I'm over time already. So I'm going to leave you with this slide, and I'm going to thank you all. Okay, that's that's great. Thanks very much, Sebastian. Um, I think, uh, as you said, uh, I, I took up a couple minutes of time at the start, and uh, we do have quite short 15-minute uh, slots here. So thanks for thanks for ending when you did. Uh, just for future speakers that come up in the session, when I turn my video on, uh, if if you can if you can see that and monitor for that, that'll indicate that you should be wrapping up within a minute or two. So um, that's super interesting work, and I think that we we may. Um, bypass questions on this one, and if we have time later on, we can come back to those. Uh, I'm, I'm particularly interested in the hot spots around the edges and, and, and what their cause is, but we, that's something that we can discuss later. So um, our, our next speaker that I'd like to introduce today is Eric Choi from GHGSAT, and GHGSAT's been up to uh, many interesting things lately, uh, super, super active, uh, uh, you know, emerging business and, and continuing research program with new satellites in the air recently. So. Um, Eric, uh, would you like to take it away? Yes, David, thank you very much. Uh, I hope uh, everybody's able to hear me and see me okay. Maybe Dave, if you could give me a thumbs up. Uh, that's yeah, uh, always okay. good to know. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be here this morning, particularly in the session that uh, in many ways, my remarks are going to complement at least uh, two of the uh, subsequent presentations. So. Um, I'm going to start at a bit of a high level, and then my colleague Jean-Philippe McLean is going to speak in a little more detail about our instrument and our retrieval algorithms, and then uh, a very happy complementarity, uh, Chris McLinden from ECCC is going to talk about uh, his team work in uh, independently uh, assessing our observations. So as Dave said, um, we at GHGSAT are an SME headquartered in Montreal, and uh, we have a fleet of methane sensing satellites uh, in orbit as we speak. So um, as recently as it was actually the 25th of May, just last month, uh, we launched our newest three satellites, bringing our constellation to a total of six satellites. And as I said, my colleague Jean-Philippe McLean is going to talk a little bit uh, more detail about uh, the sensor and the retrieval algorithm. Um, all I'll say perhaps at this point is that what makes our satellites different than some of the other ones, um, the, the flagship uh, space agency missions, for example, is our specialization in high spatial resolution. So uh, sub 30 meter resolution of our observations, enabling us to attribute plumes directly to individual sources, uh, a, a landfill or, or, or a oil and gas field or, or, or what have you, with a precision below 2% uh, of, uh, of the overall background in, uh, in, in the field of view. Um, so 
what we've seen uh, characteristically in the scientific literature, and this is uh, the chart on the left, is from you know a, a bit of a key paper from uh, Adam Brandt uh, back in 2016, in which he did a meta-analysis and found that basically the distribution of methane emissions in the oil and gas sector it very much follows this sort of long tail distribution where a, a small number of leaks contribute overwhelmingly to the total volume of uh, leakage into the atmosphere. So I believe the conclusion was something like 5% of these leaks uh, typically contribute more than 50% of the overall leakage uh, by volume. And this is a result that has been uh, subsequently confirmed by more recent studies. So for example, Zavala in 20. 17, I believe, was something like 1 to 10% of the uh, sites contributing between 40 and 80% emissions. And then uh, even more recently, uh, Riley Duran's paper in 2019, uh, coming to a very similar conclusion, something like 10% of sources that they surveyed in California are contributing to something like 60% of, uh, of sources. And it, it, the chart on the right is, is incomplete, but you know, plotting what we at GHE SAT observed both through our satellite and aircraft measure and showing very much the, the same distribution. So um, with, mind, with a mind towards the uh, word policy in the uh, title of this session, you know, what this drives, we believe, is uh, towards a, a complementarity or multi-scale, a tiered system of systems approach to, uh, to monitoring these leaks. So one can envision a scenario where we have satellites that are able to revisit frequently at high risk areas and detect the largest emissions quickly. So say 50% of the emissions by, uh, by volume. And based on those results, we can deploy aircraft uh, strategically to the highest areas of priority, picking up say the next 40% of methane by volume. And then finally having people on the ground with OGI or, or, or other uh, handheld sensors deploying where necessary and focusing their leak detection and repair um, on, the, on the final 10% of, uh, of the emissions. So I said earlier that our satellites are a bit, little bit of a niche in the sense of having very high spatial resolution, but uh, at, a, at, a, at a more narrow field, field of view. And uh, what this does is uh, incredibly complementary to the other satellites, uh, the space agency satellites that, that are up there today. So um, as an example of that, since 2019, uh, GHGSAT has had an ongoing collaboration with uh, ESRON the uh, Dutch uh, Space Research Institute and the Sentinel-5P uh, Tropomi team there. And so the complementarity comes about when we have the, the, the wide swath and, and the regional scale coverage of, of Tropomi at kilometer scale resolutions. When they detect a methane hotspot in one of their observations, they can task or, or we task one of our satellites to sort of zoom in as the methane microscope and pinpoint precisely uh, where that, uh, that emission is down to the facility level. So what I'll do is I'll quickly go over sort of two uh, case studies here. Um, one, uh, you know, both of these were from last year. So this was from February, where um, a European Sentinel satellite picked up elevated methane in Central Asia. Uh, we subsequently tasked with our satellites and, and came up with this observation. So this is actually eight plumes in, in the field of view. Um, I think the four of them are, are I believe, uh, properly with valves, and then the rest of them are are, are unlit flares. And, and these were the, these were big, big emissions. Th these were on the order of ten thousand kilograms per per hour. So, from the policy standpoint, uh, what we did was we engaged uh, various uh, diplomatic channels, uh, both the Canadian government and various European governments. And uh, for a time uh, last year these leaks were shut down, but unfortunately, subsequent observations we've made of this area more recently show that uh, unfortunately, they've, uh, they've sort of sprung up uh, again. Uh, another example here, uh, this is from last April. Uh, again, it was a, a European Sentinel satellite picking up elevated uh, methane over Bangladesh. Uh, we subsequently had a look with uh, C2, this was our Hugo satellite. And uh, this was tracked to a uh, landfill uh, outside of the capital city of uh, Dhaka. And uh, not 
quite uh, the level of emission as the previous example in Turkmenistan, but still significant. I believe this was something on the order of 4,000 uh, kilograms per hour. So uh, again, um, engaging through uh, various government channels, we're able to convey this to the Bangladeshi Ministry of the Environment, Forest and Climate Change, and they subsequently struck up a technical committee uh, to assess our results and uh, discuss uh, possible uh, avenues of, uh, of mitigation. One of the things that uh, we're uh, quite pleased about, um, uh, one of the uh, outcomes of uh, the COP26 conference late last year was uh, thanks to the support of the Government of Canada, uh, GHGSAT will be contributing our methane data to the IEMEO. So this is the International Methane Emissions Observatory. This is a program of the United Nations Environment Program supported uh, by the International Energy Agency and the European Commission. So this is gonna be a, a clearinghouse of basically data, methane data from, for, from you know, diversity of sources. So from satellites, from aircraft, ground sensors, national inventories brought together in aggregate um, you know, put through date, big data analytics uh, with the intention of uh, supporting uh, diplomatic action undertaken by, by the UN and other multilateral agencies uh, where appropriate to, uh, to, to do so. Um, I'll uh, start to wrap up here uh, with some remarks about uh, the use of our data and the availability of our data to the scientific community. And this is something that we feel, feel very strongly about and are, are proud to support. So one of the mechanisms is uh, administered by the Canadian Space Agency and east of the European Space Agency in which 5% of the capacity of our IRIS satellite C1 is made available to the scientific community. And this is uh, a mechanism, for example, that uh, you know, Chris McLinden and his team at ECCC uh, has, has made some use of and he'll discuss uh, some of his evaluation activities uh, later in this session. Uh, we're very pleased that as of last month, after a lengthy evaluation process uh, that spanned almost two years, I believed, uh, GHGSAT is now officially a third party mission uh, under the European Space Agency. And what this means is that uh, through ESA, um, member state, uh, sorry, scientists uh, in uh, ESA member state countries uh, are able to apply through this program to uh, obtain our data. And under our contract with ESA, um, this permits uh, full publication, um, you, know, you know, journals uh, and, and all that stuff. Um, you know, there, there, there's really no barrier here to using uh, commercial data for scientific purposes. And uh, the last thing I'll mention is the analogous NASA program, which is the CSDA, the Commercial Small Sat Data Acquisition Program. Uh, we are now in the evaluation process for this. And uh, NASA has, in fact, put out a solicitation uh, soliciting scientists to be involved in the, uh, the evaluation of, of our data. So um, the, the URL is, is a bit of a mess. I didn't post it here. But if you search the NASA Inspires website and uh, specifically uh, Annex 43 of the uh, research uh, ROSES 22 solicitation, you'll find information there. So. Um, I believe that non-US uh, researchers are eligible to apply, but um, you know, NASA funding cannot uh, be directed to, to non-US researchers, but perhaps there could be a, a collaboration opportunity here with, uh, with an American institution. And uh, again, um, similar to the ESA program, uh, under the NASA US government and user license agreements, uh, you know, full scientific uh, collaboration is, uh, is enabled. And uh, with that, I see Dave's smiling face and the timing is uh, not bad. So uh, thank you so much for everybody's uh, interest and attention. Yeah, that's great. Thanks. Thanks, Eric. I'll always try to smile when, and, uh, and, and not give any, any grimaces. Um, we, we probably have time for a quick question, and if anybody has a question, maybe you can uh, just put your hand up in the, in the reaction. So on Zoom, that's near the bottom right of your screen normally. You can click on reactions and uh, select raise hand. Okay, great. And if there are no questions for Eric, does, does anybody have a, uh, if we just go back, uh, to our first presentation to Sebastian about the landfills. 
Uh, does anyone have a question for Sebastian that would, they'd like to ask right at this time? Okay, so I guess we're, we're moving right along then. Um, we'll, we'll head to our next presentation, uh, which is uh, from the National Research Council. So Jalal Nouros Oulie uh, will talk to us about a new methane sensor that's being uh, developed at NRC and that has a lot of promise. So Jalal, I'll, I'll flip it over to you. Can you share your screen? Sure, thank you, Dave. Great, I can see you, I can hear you well. Okay, I can see your screen well too. Yeah, okay. Just need to minimize a few. All right. Uh, thank you very much. So it's a pleasure to be here today to tell you about. Uh, developing methane measurement capabilities for Canada at the National Research Council. Uh, my name is Jalal, and uh, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you from the traditional unceded territories of the Algonquin Anishinaabe people. Uh, at NRC, um, I work at the Black Carbon Metrology team, and uh, black carbon, similar to methane, is a short-lived climate pollutant and uh, our team has been developing measurement uh, measurement methods for black carbon for a couple of decades now. And in the past few years, we have expanded our work um, to develop instruments for measurement of methane as well. In terms of radiative forcing, methane is ranked second after carbon dioxide, but uh, we have seen numerous uh, reports that uncertainties, and in some cases, very large uncertainties in inventory estimates of methane have, uh, have been reported. Uh, here are two examples. Uh, one is a Canadian study, and the other one is a study in the US. Uh, the study in Canada quantified methane emissions in two regions of Alberta, namely Red Deer and Lloydminster using an aircraft. And it was found that in the Lloydminster area, the emissions were about uh, four times larger than inventory estimates. And in the red deer area, the measurements uh, were about the same as national inventory reports, but uh, about 18 times larger than industry reported values. The US study, uh, which involved both ground surveys and aircraft measurements found that emissions, are, uh, emissions along the oil and gas supply chain were about 60% uh, larger than estimates from EPA. These, this, these discrepancies may be attributed to um, um, to unreported venting, for example, or fugitive emissions due to abnormal operating conditions or, or leaks from equipment. Um, to cover these gaps, uh, we believe that making more measurements is crucial uh, in order to cover this gap between national inventory estimates and um, top-down approaches that are, for example, performed using aircraft. And um, one of the promising platforms for covering this gap might be unmanned aerial vehicle-based measurements that could cover a range of a spatial and uh, temporal uh, scales. And that has been one of our uh, motivations, uh, where in such measurements, a small UAV carrying a small sensor payload would uh, fly around a number of facilities and try to measure methane concentration uh, on a regular basis. Uh, the sensor we are developing uh, is basically relying on a very basic principle, and it is absorption of light by gas molecules, in this case, methane. Uh, and by measuring transmitted light through a sample, gas concentration uh, can, be, uh, can be found. Uh, and the governing law is the famous Beer Lambert law, where the I, I0. At uh, I zero is, is the intensity of light at frequency zero, uh, frequency nu, and I is the intensity of light as detected, for example, by um, by a photo detector. Um, and uh, looking at at the optical thickness, which is the exponent here, we see that it is proportional to 
uh, gas concentration, as well as absorption path length and uh, the intensity of the excitation or the transition of molecule we are studying. And F is just a normalized line, uh, line shape function. Um, so in order to make the most sensitive measurement, uh, we have a, a few options. One is to increase the absorption path length. And the other one is to uh, probe methane through its strongest absorption uh, transition. Here we are using a laser source uh, that emits around 30 to 70.4 nanometer, and uh, it excites vibrational rotational transitions of methane. The reason we use this uh, um, wavelength is that uh, is that that's the strongest absorption band of methane, absorption transition of methane. And by looking at the absorption band of methane, starting from the uh, strongest band. It's the new three fundamental band, which is around 3.3 micron. And it corresponds to CH stretching vibrational motion of uh, the molecule. And uh, maybe I should add that the center of each of these bands is due to the vibration, is, is the vibrational frequency of the molecule and the spread is due to the rotational motion of the molecule. There is another band which is also related to this uh, new three fundamental band, and that is the overtone band of uh, new tree. But uh, if you look at the vertical axis, that band is almost two orders of magnitude uh, less intense than the uh, new tree fundamental band. The, the next strong band of methane uh, is around 7.7 .7 micron, and it is due to the new four bending mode of molecule. And it's about half as strong as the new tree band. Um, Traditionally, or in the older days, the two new three overtone band of methane was widely used to measure methane concentration because, uh, the, because of the advances in the telecommunication technology around 1.55 micron. Lasers were available around 1.65 micron as well uh, to probe methane using uh, these transitions. But access to a strong absorption band of methane has not been very easy until the past decade or so. Uh, where light sources with light sources with uh, single mold radiation have become available. Um, so, uh, for example, the nutri band can be covered by diode lasers uh, that are based on gallium antimonide wafers or interband cascade lasers, and the new four band can be uh, accessed these days using quantum cascade lasers. And um, we have used the gallium antimonide based diode laser, uh, which has a distributed feedback structure inside the waveguide. And uh, it is um, designed, grown, and fabricated using NRC epitaxy and fabrication facilities. The laser emits single mode radiation at 30 to 70 nanometer and operates near room temperature that's uh, relatively easily accessible by thermoelectric coolers. The laser is now commercially available in a small footprint and it is hermetically sealed and it's uh, suitable for space applications and mobile applications. Uh, zooming in further, actually zooming in, zooming in a lot <laughs> on the spectra of methane around 30 to 70 nanometer to see the coverage range of the laser, uh, which is shown by the shaded area here we can see that uh, the laser can be used to measure methane absorption as well as absorption due to water. Uh, so now that we are probing the methane by exciting its the strongest absorption band, we also want to increase the absorption path length. So we designed and fabricated the teriotype uh, open path, uh, open multi-path absorption cell composed of two gold mirrors that are op opposing each other. And they uh, uh, reflect the laser um, such that the path length is around 6.8 meters now. And uh, on the top right, we can see the calculation results from a ray tracing program that was uh, developed to aid the optomechanical design. And on the uh, lower, lower left, we see an example or an illumination of an experimental setup that was uh, done for demonstration using a visible red laser. Um, the other thing that we do to improve the performance is modulating the laser wavelength. And this is done by uh, adding a relatively high frequency sine wave on top of a ramp signal. 
for rapid modulation of the laser wavelength. Uh, while the laser wavelength is swept across, uh, across an absorption, for example, for methane, by doing this, the intensity of uh, light is modulated. And this is the type of signal that the detector sees. If we look at this signal in the frequency domain, uh, we can see that by narrowband detection of signal around, uh, around harmonics of the modulation frequency, we are effectively able to reject noise at all other frequencies. For example, in this case, we are using uh, second harmonic detection for which the spectrum will look like this. This is an idealized spectrum. You will notice later that the actual spectrum differs a little bit because of the behavior of the laser uh, to injection current. So this way, by narrowband detection of the signal around the second harmonic here, uh, effectively, effectively rejecting noise at all other frequencies. Um, uh, here's a schematic lock diagram of the sensor, just uh, for a general idea of how it works. Uh, the detector and the laser are put on thermoelectric coolers, and they are controlled by their respective temperature controllers. Uh, the signal for driving the laser and uh, reading the signal from the photo detector is done by an FPGA board. Uh, and the FPGA board also demodulates the signal from the photo detector. And a single board computer uh, acquires the demodulated signal and stores the data. Uh, the sensor is also equipped with uh, tem uh, temperature, pressure, and relative humidity sensors and a GPS. And uh, the power source can be a five volt uh, power pack uh, that powers the whole thing. And here are some quick results. The right panel shows the output of the FPGA based locking amplifier that shows methane and water absorption features. Uh, the peak to peak height of the absorption feature is an indicator of gas concentration. And using this, gas, gas, uh, this indicator, the left panel, um, uh, shows an Allen Verla deviation plot for ambient methane uh, concentration. Uh, and this demonstrates a short term sensitivity of uh, around four parts per billion at one hertz uh, acquisition rate. Um, and here is how the sensor prototype actually looks like. Currently, the package is quite lightweight and it weighs about 1.8 kilograms uh, without batteries and it consumes less than 15 watts at round room temperatures and the uh, electronics enclosure houses the pc 104 format fpga board and the single board computer that are shown here so uh, with that um, i'm done and uh, future improvements and ruggedizing the package of the current sensor is uh, is being done right now, and uh, we are looking to test the sensor in the field uh, with the goal of deploying it on a UAV, a small UAV. And we also have plans uh, for further reduction in size, uh, power, weight, uh, and also the cost of the sensor that is uh, part of the work is done, and we are actively working on it right now. And uh, I'd like to thank my colleagues and also you for your attention. Thanks. Hey, great. Thank you, Jalal. Uh, is there, are there any questions following up uh, on, on the sensor that Jalal has been developing? So again, if you'd like to ask a question, um, you can use the rea reactions, raise your hand, and, um, and then Deb, Deborah Wunsch is asked in the chat, and I can read her question. Uh, what's the current cost of the sensor? Um, if we are talking the, about the exact same sensor that we have developed, the, uh, this is one of the earlier prototypes we have made. We have made a couple more prototypes, but usually the early prototypes cost more, but these can be made with around ten thousand dollars to fifteen thousand dollars, and if if we scale them up, of course the cost will be will be lower. Okay, great, thanks. And Scott Seymour, uh, would I, I'm not sure if you're 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 able to also speak on the session. Maybe maybe I'll have to read questions. I'm not sure, but Scott, are you able to, to speak? Yes, thanks. Okay, great. Yeah, 
Thanks, Dave. Um, nice talk, Joel. Um, really interesting. I was just curious if you foresee any field settings where the water signal might be very strong and might interfere with the 2F from methane. Um, so, so we have tested this at uh, relatively high uh, humidities. Um, what happens is that the peak of the methane is always distinct and they can always see it even close to condensation um, conditions. Uh, but what happens is that I only showed you one peak of water, but higher in the higher wavelength uh, side, there is an even a stronger water line. And what that does is that it basically eats up the laser power quite a lot at the location of the methane peak. So we need to correct for that. And by having the relative humidity uh, uh, sensor, uh, that's one way of accounting for it. But the other way is to uh, fit the direct absorption spectrum. And from there, we get the water concentration and then correct for um, the change in laser power at the wavelength of the methane peak. Great, thank you. Okay, that's great. Thanks. Uh, so we'll move on. We have next up two uh, lightning presentations, uh, advertising, pitching posters, and, and giving us a, uh, the flavor of the studies that you can uh, go and see in the other platform. Uh, and anyways, I've been having fun wandering around through that platform with my, with my little uh, avatar. And so we have Lawson Gillespie from the University of Toronto up first, and he'll be talking about methane, uh, uh, estimating methane emissions using an instrument specific Gaussian plume inversion model. Lawson? We, I can see your screen. Looks good. Hi, um, thank you all for uh attending this presentation. My name is Lawson Gillespie and I'm a PhD student working with Dr. Deborah Wunsch at the University of Toronto and a research affiliate working with Dr. Felix Vogel at Environment Ch Climate Change Canada. And today I would like to talk to you about uh, my research quantifying urban methane emissions using mobile in-situ measurements. Um, shown here, you can see our mobile laboratory uh, in the bicycle trailer. There is a Los Gatos Research Ultra Portable Greenhouse Gas Analyzer and a little bit off screen, a GPS enabled weather station, which allows us to record coincidental uh, greenhouse gas concentration and meteorological data. Um, our research group has been doing this since the summer of 2017, uh, and I joined the group in 2019. Um, in the top right here, you can see an example of a uh, typical day's observations with location uh, and methane concentration shown by the, the color of these dots. Um, we have all of this data publicly available um, and publicly viewable on our website. If you just Google GTA emissions project, you should be able to find it quite easily. Um, informed by the, the map of the city shown in the top right here, we can get a sense of all of the observations uh, which have been conducted since the uh, start of the year 2020, um, uh, showing the range that we've been able to cover across the city uh, during the public health crisis. Um, and from this sort of naive plot, you can see a number of distinct point sources of emissions pop up from our measurements, including the Ashbridge's Bay Wastewater Treatment Plant shown in the bottom right here. Uh, the Tommy Thompson Park uh, artificial wetland uh, area, the Keating Channel, which is where the mouth of the Don River flows or does not flow into Lake Ontario, um, which usually suffers from anoxic water conditions and uh, is a source of methane, which is currently uninventoried and unaccounted for um, in various methane inventories of the city, um, as well three distinct sources along the water frontier are the combined sewage overflow basins, which uh, I discussed later in my poster. So typically what we do from these kinds of measurements is we extract the downwind uh, greenhouse gas enhancement plumes, which is the enhancement above the background concentration. Um, and we try and estimate emissions rates from point sources using uh, Bayesian inversion on a Gaussian plume uh, dispersion model. So the bulk of the work that I'm talking about in this poster is uh, building upon earlier studies by uh, 
Dr. Ars in uh, 2020, where he and colleagues compared different experimental setups and different instrument uh, setups uh, using different inversion techniques. So the first technique they uh, used was to invert the peak concentration uh, of the enhancement. And they found that comparing different instruments with different flow rates, this resulted in poor correlation uh, between their observations. And by accounting for, instead of the peak concentration, the total enhancement area, so the uh, area under the concentration versus distance or concentration versus time uh, plots had significantly better correlation between different instruments and different uh, different experimental setups. And so my poster talks about reconciling these differences uh, and comparing four different inversion techniques. Uh, by and large, all of them are quite similar, so long as uh, conditions uh, of a complete transect uh, are met in the downwind. Uh, downwind transect. Um, if you have any further questions, I would invite you to come to the poster section, uh, session where I'll have more time to explain uh, the work that I've done. Thank you for your attention. That's great. Thanks very much, Lawson. So uh, for those of you who have questions about Lawson's work or want to uh, get the full presentation, uh, please attend the, the poster session in the, as I said, in the other, um, uh, the other platform. And so next up, we have Jean-Philippe McLean from GHGSAT, and he'll talk about detecting and quantifying methane emissions using the GHGSAT constellation. So are you able to share your All screen? All right, great, yes. Jean-Philippe? Thanks, Dave. Uh, great, super, uh, thanks. Can you see this yet? Can you see? It's coming up. Yes, we got your PowerPoint. Okay, and I'll do this, and then I'll swap. Okay, how's that? Looks good. Thanks. Great. All right. So thanks. Um, yeah, thanks for giving me this opportunity here. So what I want to do in my poster is, um, you know, Eric Choi gave a, a great sort of high level overview presentation of what we do at GHGSAT. Um, I'm a physicist by training and I've been working at GHGSAT now for a year and a half. And uh, I wanted to talk about some of the empirical analysis that we've done over the past year or so with the launches of C1 and C2, which were launched um, about a year and a half ago for C2. But before I jump in, I just wanted to show this because this is, I think is pretty cool. We just launched three satellites, May 25th, uh, 2022. And uh, these are essentially copies of what we, you know, of what we had in space. So we're slowly building up our constellation. Uh, we're working in a spectral region of 1.6. As Eric said, we've got targeted, we work in target mode. Um, at um, roughly 30 meter resolution. And we have an average revisit time of about seven days. That depends on the latitude. Um, but with these three satellites, we wanna launch six more by 2023, such that we'll have 11 in space uh, and we're getting close to this um, daily revisit time of any target in the world. And so since May 25th, we've actually had first light on all three satellites. So C3, C4, C5. Now, when they come out, they come out kind of bunched together. And so this was a great opportunity to look at one plume uh, with all three satellites 60 seconds apart. And so here you can see C3, C4, uh, C5 in sequence and uh, taken on the 28th with, with about a minute, minute separation from the first to the third. Um, okay, so that's just kind of a preview of, you know, what's happening right now at GHGSAT. Of course, my poster is going to be talking about what we've done over the past year. Um, so C2 and C1, we've made a lot of design changes, which has enabled us to uh, increase our detection threshold going from somewhere around 1000 kilograms per hour on our demonstration satellite to 100 kilograms per hour. And so in the poster, I'll talk about some of the key performance metrics um, that, that we looked at. So including column precision. So essentially how does the um, standard deviation of our retrieved methane vary as a function of different per parameters, including for example, the albedo or uh, the standard deviation in the albedo. And uh, what we find is that um, you know, our target was to get the column precision of 1% of background and we are sort of on that order. Uh, of course, depending on the environmental conditions, we can vary between one and 2% of background. The other thing we've done is we've done a series of uh, controlled releases by our, you know, ourselves and with uh, customers and um, collaborators. And uh, we've built this chart of uh, you know, the, the, the retrieved emission rate as a function of ground truth emission rate. And in these controlled releases, the lowest detection rate that we have looked at is about 100 
103 kilograms per hour. And then finally, I'll just flash these maps up. Um, this is just kind of a yearly retrospective of you know a year in space with C1 and C2. Uh, so we've looked at over 100,000 sites um, where, in this case, you know one observation can 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 count for uh, multiple sites uh, all across the world. And if we look at the total emissions that we've measured, uh, we you know have detected with these two satellites 143. Um, megatons of CO2 equivalent. And of that 143, we've taken action or mitigated uh, with our you know, collaborators and clients, uh, 2.3 uh, megatons of CO2 equivalent. And so this is you know, great progress for us. And as we essentially build our constellation, we'll be able to um, essentially detect you know, local emissions on a global scale. And that's, that's really what we want to do. So if you want to learn more, if you want to, you know, if you have more questions to ask me, feel free to stop by the poster and uh, we can, you know, we can chat. Thanks a lot. Okay, super. Thanks for that. Uh, this is, session's going great. We're right on time, I think. Uh, and uh, definitely talked about uh, space and about sensors. And uh, well, next talk again is another uh, GHG set oriented talk um, from Chris McLinden. And uh, Chris will talk about uh, evalu evaluating GHG SAT uh, for emissions monitoring over Canada. So, Chris, are you here? Yeah, yep. I'm seeing your screen. Trying to share. It's kind of working. Oh, here we go. Uh, where was I? One sec here. Ah. Hang on. Sorry. Just slow response here. Um, okay. Bail out of. Sorry, presentation mode. Okay, let's try that again. Okay, so yeah, so on behalf of my uh, co-authors, I just wanted to, okay. Um, I, think, I think we just have some lag in your screen. Okay, uh, okay. Just to anyway, let yeah. you know, I, I can see your PowerPoint if you can launch it up into the, into the full mode. Um, we we just we actually see the presentation mode on on our screen oh. over Zoom. Okay. Uh, shoot. And and if that's the case, you can go from the other from the other screen. Yeah. How do I switch uh, display settings? Yeah. There. Is that better? Go. Okay. That's okay. It. That we're perfect. Thanks. Okay. Um. Yes, so um, right, uh, probably this is maybe not that necessary just to point out uh, there's actually quite a few satellites that have been launched that are sensitive to methane. Uh, many of them, however, are not sensitive to methane at the surface. And really it's been more recently that, that the, uh, the spectral region where that is sensitive has been, is being exploited. Um, well, I've got a wicked leg here. Uh, okay, uh, we just, we I guess, pretty much heard all of this in the previous talk, so uh, um, yeah, so we should keep going here. Yeah, so, the, but the goals of our study, right, so what we're trying to do is, um, as, as Eric sort of hinted at, was conduct our own evaluation of GHG SAT methane observations with really uh, with an eye for its, um, its usefulness for, for methane monitoring in Canada. And so um, some of the things we wanna to try to do here are to uh, quantify the precision of the um, retrieved methane scenes, the actual uh, pixel, pixel values of the, of the column methane. And from that ultimately, the emissions detection limit, um, as well as some other important quantities. And to do this, we're gonna actually use a combination of GHG SAT data, um, but as well as plume modeling. Um, and to each of these, we want to look at uh, applying different emissions algorithms to see how um, they vary, the results vary. With, again, with the ultimate goal of, of how how could GHG SAT support applications such as Canadian regulatory reporting? Uh, and so to date, we've acquired 140 scenes um, from uh, two of the GHG SAT 
140 scenes total from two of the GHG sat uh, satellites, roughly um, half from their C1 and half from their C2. Um, and of the 40, of the 40 observations, five have uh, positive detections or, or what GHG sat would say confirmed uh, plumes within them. There are, there are a few others that are maybe look like plumes, but are not, have not been confirmed. And so just to give you a quick sense of what um, the GHG sat data that we acquire looks at. So this is once the, uh, the spectra have been inverted and, and their geolocations have been done and, and all of that, um, uh, we, we get data that's, that's more like a level two product, uh, which includes a reflectivity scene at 1.6 microns. So here's a scene in Southern Saskatchewan and um, you can see the, uh, the, the vertical and horizontal lines correspond to roads. So that gives you a sense of the, the spatial resolution. The, the dark are the, uh, whoops, the dark are some uh, small lakes, right, which are not very reflective at this wavelength. Um, and then just to the right of that um, uh, is uh, the actual methane field uh, uh, presented as an excess methane. Um, so the difference between some sort of uh, scene-wide background value. Um, scene three or layer three here, what they call layer three in the bottom left is, uh, is their uh, estimate of their uncertainty. And then ultimately a mat, uh, layer four here, which is a masks uh, showing which, which pixels should be considered uh, good quality and which are not. In this case, a, um, a plume was detected and that's sort of highlighted here um, in this oval and in this layer five in the top right. Um, and, and that sort of replotted that blown up in overlaid in Google Earth. And, and actually this shows two different plumes from two different dates with more or less the same source location. And so we see emissions from, from this on the order of 500 kilograms per hour. Uh, I would say this example in terms of uncertainties, um, methane precision is probably about as, uh, the best that we have. Um, and um, here we, I would, I don't have the number here, but um, uh, using the analysis of about to present the uncertainty would be about 1%. Uh, just to give a, a flavor for some of the other scenes we've gotten, uh, sort of chosen semi-randomly, three scenes, um, so the, again, this is the excess methane field or three scenes from the C1 satellite and C2. And one thing that maybe jumps out at you is the uh, more color variations in the C1, which suggests that maybe it's not as precise, maybe the, the, the more random errors. Um, so I don't wanna belabor this too much. Um, so moving on to uh, our, the beginning of our analysis. So one thing we'd like to uh, examine is the precision of these scenes. So here's another scene on the top right. And so um, the assumption is that uh, the bulk of the variability in these is dominated by random errors from the instrument itself and or the, the retrievals. And so to quantify this, we take a box as, sh as shown here, calculate the standard deviation of all the methane values within this box, slide the box around all over the scene and we get a histogram shown here. And then um, we quantify the precision as the median of this. And so um, um, this allows for some sort of more slowly varying um, values throughout the scene, as well as maybe some some real variability, right? Some actual variation in methane itself. Uh, and so for this scene, we'd see a precision of about 5% for this C1 satellite, just as an example. Now, we're not, we weren't, especially going into this, we weren't sure how many scenes we were gonna get. And um, we wanted to construct a model that could take whatever scenes we did get and try to be able to quantify uh, um, the, the precision. Um, so a model that, that represents as a function of some um, predictor variables, what the precision would be for one of the, one of their sensors. And so we 
identified that the sun angle, the reflectivity of the surface and, and the surface, um, the variability of the surface uh, terrain are three useful predictors um, as shown here for the two sensors, C1 and C2. Um, so there's, there's at least some, some correlation with these for both, both of these sensors, uh, I would say. Uh, and clearly one sees the precisions calculated are higher for C1 and then lower for C2. Uh, this, this is sort of um, a well-known and, and, and GHG SAT explained to us that this is expected C2 as an additional filter and their more, more recent sensors are based on the C2 design. So um, if we are able to get our hands on some of those observations, we expect it to behave much more like these red dots here. Uh, and so with this model, we can, we can then fit for these coefficients um, and then test it against the original, against the original um, observations. And, you know, for a simple model, I think it's, 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 it performs fairly well. And more importantly, um, all of these predictors, um, one doesn't need to have an observation for it to, to, to have, right? So the albedo is something that we can obtain without GHGSAT using another satellite. Uh, you know, we readily get the, um, the variability of the surface terrain. And of course, sun angle is just a function of latitude and season. And so we can then try to see how what the precision would be for a myriad of, of locations. So not just the ones where we have observations for, but methane emission sites within various databases. And so here's um, many of these locations here. And then we can use our model to estimate what the precisions would be. Um, and so um, we're going to see differences between the summer and winter. Uh, a little bit maybe due to sun angle, but more so due to the, the change in reflectance with snow on the ground, right? That's winter here really replies, implies the train's covered with snow and, and snow's dark at the, this wavelength. So we see typical values of the order of 2% for C2 and, and more like 4.5% for C1 in the summer. They're the more ideal conditions, higher values in the winter. Uh, and Maybe I should have mentioned this off the top, but I mean, the, the precision is one of the most important factors, maybe along with spatial resolution, which she said does very well at, in, uh, in its ability to obtain um, methane emissions with, uh, with a high degree of precision and, and good detection limits. So I just have a couple slides left here. So um, again, another piece of this was using this information to estimate emissions, uh, both. So here we see uh, one, that example plume from earlier where I've just rotated it so it looks like it's coming out of the north. Um, and, um, you know, GHG SAT in this case provided us with an estimate of the emissions. And, and here I'm just sort of uh, illustrating one method that we've been exploring, alternative method to, to try to get at emissions, uh, which I don't have time really to go into, but. Um, uh, it, here, here are some preliminary comparisons in which uh, we're using a, a method uh, somewhat similar, but but you know with significant differences from what GHG Sat's using. And for for several of these locations where we have uh, a plume, and we see for the most part fairly good agreement. Uh, one always has to be careful with the details, though. Um, Wind speed is important, and where one gets their wind speed can depend or it can, can lead to different answers. Um, so the, the, the plot on the right shows, for example, uh, different sources of wind speed for the same locations at the same time of day. Um, generally good agreement between the three. Um, for, for one example, uh, we see a factor of two difference, right? So that leads to, you know, something close to maybe a factor of two difference in emissions. So lots to consider here. Um, you know, the devil's always in the details when one dives into this, this type of thing. Uh, and the other piece I just want to touch on briefly is we want to be able to simulate our own plumes at these locations that I showed earlier, from which then we can apply um, 
these precisions to generate sort of uh, synthetic GHG SATA observations. So we, we're using an in-house plume spot dispersion model used for our emergency response team, um, which we can um, get, which we can run at 25 meter uh, spatial resolution. Okay, so, um, you know, we've begun this project, we've got about another year, so we're really just sort of hitting our stride. Uh, so just to summarize, um, you know, we think we, we, we do a reasonable job um, estimating precisions for the, for the C1 and C2 sensors. We're just now applying um, emission retrieval algorithms to both the real data and our synthetic data. Uh, we're interested in acquiring scenes from these new satellites that, that were teased earlier. Hopefully we can um, start acquiring some of, some of those throughout the summer. Um, also, we're, we're in um, consultation, we're, we're in talks with um, GHG SAT and a natural gas pipeline company to try to coordinate a, a release where um, ourselves, GHG SAT and the, the company all um, provide emissions um, without any of us knowing what the other is um, has, has in advance. And then we can sort of compare and analyze and ultimately we want to sort of frame our results in a Canadian context. Thank you. Okay, great. Thanks for that, Chris. Super interesting work. Uh, and so we'll move ahead on this one. Um, uh, if, we, if we have time for questions later, uh, which looks like we probably won't, then we can come back to Chris. Um, but I what, do want to move on to our next speaker so that we give everyone their time. Uh, so we have uh, Regina Gonzalez Maguel from McGill, and so she'll be talking about isotope geochemistry and um, sure. uh, and using uh, carbon isotope measurements for source attribution of atmospheric methane. Yeah. So are you able to? Okay, that's great. So I can see your screen just fine. Uh, thank you, David. Can you see the presentation here? Yeah, that all looks good. Perfect. So just give me a sec. Okay, so hi, everyone. As David mentioned, my name is Regina. I'm doing a PhD at McGill University working with Peter Douglas. And today I will be talking about a project we were working in last year with Environment and Climate Change Canada, in which we were testing if we could use carbon isotopes to study sources of methane in the Athabasca oil sands. Uh, and the background for this project is that, well, the Athabasca oil sands deposits are one of the largest oil reserves in Canada, and their extraction account for around 12% of Canada's total greenhouse gas emissions. And these emissions are quantified through inventories, but in recent years, several studies have been showing that these inventories underestimate greenhouse gas emissions. And specifically, specifically for methane, there was an aircraft study using data from 2013 that showed that methane emissions are much larger than what is reported. And then in this same study, they found that most emissions come from two main sources, which are this open mines and from tailing spawns. But unfortunately, there hasn't been any studies updating these findings since 2013. And in specific, there are not many methods in place that allow us to separate the contribution from different sources to methane emissions in this region. So with this in mind, uh, what we were aiming to do in this project was to test if we could use carbon-13 and carbon-14 to determine how much each source contributes to methane emissions in the Athabasca oil sands region. And we based off this previous study to identify the three sources 
the three key sources, which are the tailings ponds, the open mines, and we added a third source, which is wetland because they cover a very large area in the province and they are significant uh, sources of methane. And next, I'm going to give a quick explanation on how isotopes can help us answer these questions in case you're not very familiar with them. Uh, first up, we have carbon-13 in the x-axis. And carbon-13 undergoes fractionation depending on how methane is formed. So when methane is formed by high pressures and temperatures, such as with fossil fuels, it tends to be more positive than when it's formed by microbial processes, like in wetlands and, or lakes. And on the other axis, we have carbon-14 that is expressed as delta-14C. And because it's corrected for fractionation, it reflects the type of substrate that is used for methanogenesis. So fossil fuels have a value of minus 1,000, and methane from primary productivity is very positive. So we can use this plot uh, to identify our three main sources, which are wetlands, which are microbial, but also modern. And then the surface mines, um, sorry, the tailing spawns, the substrate is fossil fuel, but the process in which methane is generating is microbial. So we, we should have a very negative 13C and 13 and 14C. And last we have the surface mines, which, um, should be quite positive in 13C, but quite negative in 14C. Uh, well, what we, oh, sorry, what we did was we went to, for my case South Research Station, which is marked in this map, and to collect our samples. And what, what's nice about this station is that it's surrounded to the north and south by the largest mines and to the left and right with forest wetland complexes, which are highlighted in green in this map. So what we expected was to collect samples from different air directions that would be representative of these different uh, facilities and um, natural sources. Uh, we collected a total of 14 air samples in 2019, and then we sent the cylinders to New Zealand where we extracted the methane and analyzed carbon-13 and carbon-14. And the next thing we did was we used high split to generate air back trajectories for the whole sampling campaign. And the important aspects of this graph is that all the samples we collected were mainly from two air directions, um, from the north and from the south. And we know based on the previous study that the largest facilities um, are in the south and also the largest tailing ponds are in the south. Um, the next thing we did was we separated our samples in the samples that originated from the south and from the north, and we built killing plots with them. And just as a quick reminder, in case you don't remember well how killing plots work, uh, here we are assuming that the isotopic signature is a combination between the background isotopic signature and the source isotopic signature. So if we plot the isotopic value against the concentration, we can find the isotopic value of the source uh, through the intercept of the line. So in these graphs, uh, the red are the samples from the north and the black are the samples from the south. 
we found the intercepts uh, for both samples. And then what we did was to plot it in the graph I showed before. And from here, we need a, a, a mixing model to separate the contributions from each individual source. So we calculated the actual contributions in a computer using this mixing model. And we found that approximately 35% of our emissions were originating from tailings and 55% from um, the surface mines. And only 10% was originated from wetlands. However, as you can see here, uh, our results still had a large uncertainty. And this is mainly because there is not really a lot of data of methane signatures from surface mines and from tailing spawn. So we had to use a wide range for these sources. But on the other hand, these results are quite exciting because this is one of the first study that has been successful in using both carbon-13 and carbon-14 for so source attribution of atmospheric methane. So um, for next, the next steps in this research would include reducing the uncertainty so that we can um, use this method. Like, and one way of doing it is to generate source 13C data. And also we can use additional tracers to improve our estimations, such as uh, ethane-methane ratios or um, hydrogen isotopes. And of course, our results were restricted to summer data, but we need to um, sample in different seasons because we know that temperature controls microbial production is very likely that the wetlands and the tailing ponds emissions changes throughout the year. And well, we also need to take annual measurements because it's very likely that mine operations don't stay um, constant throughout the years. And um, yeah, that's all I got. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, that was great. Thanks very much, Regina. Um, does anybody have questions uh, on the on this presentation? And you can ask them in the chat or or put your hand up in the reactions. Okay, and, and so maybe I'll also open the floor to anyone that has a question for uh, Chris McClendon on the GHGSAT validation study. Okay, we have a quiet group. We have a, we have a good group online. Uh, we're in, we've been in the mid thirties the whole session. so. That's great to see. Uh, thanks very much, Regina, for your presentation. And so, uh, up next, and uh, we're we're right on schedule here. I think we'll start right at uh, well, twelve fifty my time, nine fifty central. Uh, is Mark Argento from St. Francis Xavier University? Uh, and so we've been moving. We've moved in the last three talks from space to surface waters, and now we're down to uh, to the soil level and quantifying methane from uh, soils to oil, oil and gas sites. Uh, so, Mark, I'll pass it to you if you can share your screen with us. Yeah, for sure. All right. Um, okay. That looks good. All Perfect. right. And everyone can hear me all right? 
So welcome all. Uh, today I'm going to be speaking on behalf of my colleagues at the St. FX University Flux Lab, uh, as well as some of our collaborators uh, at EOSense Environmental Gas Monitoring and the University of Windsor Mundell Lab uh, about some of our work addressing methane emissions from upstream oil and gas developments in Western Canada. Um, our work would not be possible without collaboration from these excellent groups and uh, as well as the Petroleum Technology Alliance of Canada and uh, MITAX Accelerate. So methane is under widely understood to be a very potent greenhouse gas and major contributor to anthropogenic climate change. Um, in Canada, we know that uh, nearly half of our emissions, uh, our methane emissions are from oil and gas production, distribution and usage. Um, and so we know to, to limit uh, further impacts on the climate, uh, we have to take some pretty serious steps towards reduction and our newest national reduction target is an aggressive one, 75% below 2020-12 levels by 2030. Um, our research focuses on a type of methane emission uh, common in oil and gas, uh, referred to as gas migration. Um, gas migration it occurs when petroleum gases are able to leak outside of the outer casing of an energy well. Those petroleum gases are, are largely composed of methane. Um, this is a fugitive emission, meaning it's uncontrolled and unintended. And fugitive emissions are often very difficult to measure uh, because we don't know exactly where they are and when they're happening. And so the true scale uh, of this issue is, is poorly constrained, poorly constrained, excuse me. So, why do we worry about gas migration? Uh, gas migration has negative impacts on the climate, uh, on health and safety of, of those who work in the industry, and it has economic impacts. Uh, any leaking gas is, is lost product to a producer. Um, this is an issue that uh, only affects a small percentage of the wells out there, but when you consider that there are at least half a million wells in Alberta alone and, and countless millions globally, um, you know, we see, see that this, this could be a very substantial issue. Uh, testing is very sparse. Testing is, is triggered generally just when a well is, is up for legal abandonment in, in Alberta and British Columbia. Um, and so, again, we, we don't know the exact scale of this issue, but some studies have put estimates of about 5 to 13 percent of methane emissions from oil and gas uh, in Alberta. But we know this is likely to be variable uh, based on the type of well, the depth of the well, the age of the well, and, and numerous other factors. So... We have some knowledge gaps here. Uh, we, we have little understanding of the spatiotemporal, spatiotemporal variability uh, in the behavior of gas migration. So when we go out and test, how can we interpret those test results? Um, we also have issues with measurements. Uh, the, the regulatory prescribed measurement techniques uh, of today by, by the Alberta and the BC governments do not directly quantify emission rates and that lack of volumetric flux measurements makes it difficult to accurately assess the incidence and the intensity of these emissions. So we need to build up uh, um, the amount of volumetric uh, measurements that we, that we have, which is required for other sorts of, of emissions, uh, so that we can build a proper inventory and, and figure out the true scale of this issue. So, to address that issue, uh, we, we traveled to, to Western Canada and we conducted field measurements in, in the Brooks area. Um, here we were, we were addressing some wells that have been flagged for gas migration issues. Uh, we had two objectives, two sort of higher level objectives. Uh, one was to address the temporal, the temporal behavior of gas migration at one site, uh, as well as uh, the incidents across many sites. And this will help us to address our spatiotemporal variability as well as build inventory. So we have two common measurement methods that are used. The regulatory standard method is referred to as the bar hole method. This is uh, on the left, on 
uh, labeled uh, image number one there. So essentially how that method is conducted is by, uh, by drilling shallow wells into the soil to about 50 meters depth in, in a radial area around the wellhead. And then you'll be able to, to measure uh, the concentration drawn from the gas within those little shallow wells. The second uh, measurement method is uh, non, non standard uh, regulatorily speaking, and that is using uh, soil surface flux chambers to measure the flux rate at surface. So you can see in, in the second image there, the, the flux chamber method. So the flux, uh, the flux chamber measures the, the rate of change in concentration over time at the surface and, and is a more direct um, measurement of, of, the, of the rate of gas transfer. So our preliminary field findings uh, in, as far as temporal patterns go, we know that wind speed and barometric pressure were very interesting to us. Uh, we've seen in, in previous studies that, that high winds can increase the, the diffusion rate of gas leaving the soil. And uh, our field measurements showed us that on the days following a day of high wind, the flux rates were generally lower. You can see that in plots uh, A and B. And this suggests that there may have been sort of a near synchronous increase in flux rate with the high wind, uh, which makes sense, uh, followed by a period of depletion that may be prolonged. Um, as far as barometric pressure goes, the, the physics of barometric pressure pumping are, are well understood and have been demonstrated in gas migration field experiments by others. Uh, and so these ones were, were, were quite clear and we saw in our, in our measurements that pressure was negatively correlated to flux rate. So whenever we had a, a high, high barometric pressure, we were gonna see a lower flux rate uh, in the field. So addressing some more of the gaps, we've looked at gas migration uh, modeling and, and looking at a shallow upper soil system. So, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, we sought out to essentially compare these two techniques uh, in a model environment, the, the in-soil method and the surface soil method uh, to determine uh, the effects of different environmental parameters, uh, which might impact the reliability of each method. So <clears throat> the model is represented visually on the right side of your screens there. And, and just starting from the bottom, essentially what we have here is a one meter layered soil column uh, into which methane gas is leaking and, and diffusing uh, vertically one dimension through that model domain. Um, at each time step, the model outputs the concentration of methane in each layer, as well as the methane flux from the uppermost soil layer into the atmosphere. So by doing that, we can essentially simulate the in-soil measurement method by the, the layer concentration, as well as a surface flux measurement above as the flux from the, from the uh, upper soil into the atmosphere. Um, the, the parameters that we were manipulating uh, that we wanted to see change in and see how they affected the system were the soil texture, uh, which is uh, represented by the by the porosity, which controls the diffusivity of, of the porous media, the soil water content, which again uh, controls um, the diffusivity as the as the pore space fills with water, uh, the gas is, is unable to 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 diffuse as efficiently, and the temperature and temperature. Um, temperature controls biological CH4 production within the soil. Um, as temperatures rise, uh, so will the amount of biological production. So uh, our first major set of, of simulations assess the impact of soil texture on the in-soil methane concentration, as would be measured by an in-soil barhole probe. So these were conducted at steady state, meaning that uh, the leak rate of methane into the soil and all other soil parameters uh, were held constant throughout the simulation. So we compared three soils, clay, loam, and sand, as you'll see on the chart, uh, which each had a different texture and different diffusivity. 
So we can see from the plot that at the 50 centimeter depth under the same leak rate, we see a very wide range of concentrations that could be measured. We take the sand, which has a very high diffusivity and it barely exceeds 1000 ppm uh, methane at 50 centimeters depth. Uh, that contrasts very strongly with the clay, which has a higher uh, or is a less diffusive uh, media and is at over 100,000 ppm at the same depth under the same leak rate into the soil. So here's where we see the major issue with the in-soil method and that we, we need to consider ga a gas migration test at two different well sites with the same amount of gas migration, but different textures. If we were to measure at the site with a more diffusive, say sandier soil, we might not think there's a problem there at all. Whereas if we were looking at the clay site, we might jump up and say, wow, this is terrible. What a GM problem. So we have, we have a real potential here to have a false negative reading and, uh, and overlook a really severe problem. So, you know, that brings forward a, a, a false sense of security and we could potentially overlook a serious safety or environmental liability. So our second set of simulations were conducted under transient uh, conditions, meaning that that certain parameters were allowed to vary over time. Uh, we looked at our environmental variables here, our soil water content and temperature, which varied seasonally in accordance with the ecoregion uh, patterns of different different regions of Alberta. So if you'll recall that soil water content is going to exert controls on diffusivity because the pore space is becoming filled with water uh, as opposed to air and the temperature is going to control the biologically produced methane in the soil. Uh, so we're adding that to the system in addition to the methane that is simulated to leak into the bottom of the model domain. So we tested each soil texture again against two different leak rates this time, the 1.0 uh, meters cubed per day and 0 0.1 meters cubed per day as they're labeled on both the concentration plot A and flux plots B. So we observed uh, that, again, soil texture exerted very strong controls on in soil concentration as we expected. Uh, it was very, it varied strongly over the course of the year. It was a very poor indicator of the leak rate into the soil. Um, flux rates are were much less sensitive to changing soil conditions and were controlled only by the leak rate into the soil uh, and the, um, the amount of biological production that was occurring. As we see, uh, the, the peak in the flux rates on the charts over B side uh, occurs in the summer, which is when biological production would be highest in the system. That contrasts with the concentration, where concentration peaks uh, during the colder season, which is a result of more, uh, more or less diffusive soil conditions during the cold months. So these observations are consistent with the underlying physical theory here. And we know that flux rates are, are going to be controlled in the system by conservation of mass, and that the flux in of methane entering the system must equal the flux out. The soil is simply adjusting its internal concentration gradient uh, to, to satisfy this, this conservation of mass. So in conclusion, um, in soil or, or bar holes, methane concentration measurements uh, are not a suitable measurement approach for the assessment of gas migration. Um, concentration is strongly controlled by, by soil texture and, and temporal site conditions, which are highly variable from site to site uh, and at the same site, depending on the time of the year. Flux measurements provide a more direct way to, to measure volumetrically what is going on in that system. And we know that the measurement must represent the amount of gas that is coming through that system. So we need to choose our measurement method uh, in these sorts of situations very carefully uh, as to not add additional uncertainty to an already very variable process. And so by, by decreasing the uncertainty of our, uh, our, our methodology um, and compiling a greater amount of, of, of measurements, good measurements at the well pad, uh, we're going to have a better, uh, a better chance at, at constraining the, the, the impacts of this issue. 
Okay, that's great. Thanks, Mark. Uh, and so that draws our session to a close. Uh, I, I just wanted to allow uh, out, uh, one quick question here from Kirk Ozadetz, uh, who has had his hand up for a little while during the talk. Um, yes, I, I guess um, my, my question is uh, primarily with respect to the, um, the other gases that you sampled. Uh, did you did you find any indication for um, microbial methane oxidation uh, in your sampling? And uh, if so, what proportion of the migrating gas do you think might have been oxidized microbially? There, it, for for our work, we we did not look uh, at any of the at the of the subsurface gas measurements. Um, we 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 focus strictly on the on on the flux chamber measurements and the above soil, and uh, our other our other collaborators uh, in the Mundel lab have worked uh, more on the subsurface side. Um, all that yeah. I can say speak to that is that that I know that it would be, you know, strong strongly dependent again on on the site conditions and the type of soil to see what sort of of methane oxidation would be occurring in these types well, of situations. I, I, I guess I, I just say that, um, uh, you know, even if you use um, a spike probe uh, for sampling the gas, uh, did you see carbon dioxide? Did you analyze for it? And did you, did you distinguish between carbon dioxide from methane oxidation versus plant respiration by isotopic methods? Uh, no, I didn't. I did personally did not work on any of the the subsurface measurements uh, on this project. Okay, thanks to both of you, and thanks to all of our speakers for the session. Uh, so, just to remind everybody that the session keeps going throughout the day. Um, so, in an hour and forty five minutes, we're back at the we're at the poster session over in Gather Town, and so you can walk your avatar over to over to a number of posters that are affiliated with this session and, um, and they're intermixed uh, in the poster hall with others. And then an hour later, we come back for more talks uh, in this section in 5041. Um, so we'll see you there. Thanks very much to everybody again. And uh, I look forward to talks later this afternoon.